So. so thank you, Jerry, for, in, for inviting me and considering my name for, the, for this talk. Uh, my name is Christian Vite Lopes. I'm from, from Brazil, from the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. And today I'm gonna talk about uh, molecular sieves and the title of my presentation is Tracking Metallic Species in Molecular Sieves by X-ray Absorption Spectroscopy. So, so uh, I'm from the most Southern state of Brazil, Rio Grande do Sul. I'm working in Porto Alegre at the Laboratory of Reactivity and Catalysis. And I'm about 1,000 kilometers far from the Brazilian synchrotron, the new source uh, in Campinas, Sao Paulo. So today I'm going to talk about zeolites as molecular sieves, then uh, the metallic species that we normally find in, in molecular sieves. And then I brought three scientific cases and then at the end, the acknowledgements. So molecular sieves, here you can see uh, in, in the picture. Uh, the molecular sieves are solids with defining porosity and capacity of distinguishing molecules by their geometries and dimensions. So you can see here the ducts. Here we have the molecular sieves and we can dis discriminate the molecules by the size of the pores. So the zeolites, uh, which I'm going to talk about today, they are crystalline microporous materials with less than two nanometers uh, of size formed by the union of silicon and aluminum tetrahedra linked together by oxygen atoms. So here you have an, an example of the, of the pore aperture of the zeolite. So they are 3D porous structures with T atoms like silicon, aluminum, or germanium, titanium, tetrahedrally coordinated. And they typically have uh, framework density of less than 21 T atoms, T atoms, for example, silicon or aluminum per uh, thousand uh, angstrom cubic. So the zeolites, they have an important uh, property like the ion exchange. In the structure, uh, when a silicon atom is substituted by an aluminum, we have this charge because of the difference of the valence. So this charge needs to be compensated by a cation. So this intrinsic property give uh, to the zeolite the ion exchange uh, capacity. So when we substitute, for example, sodium cations by uh, ammonium, and then we calcine this the zeolite, we obtain a bronsted acid site which, is an, uh, which gives to the zeolite another uh, very important property like the acidity. So here uh, I have a, an example of the formation of the zeolites. We begin with a tetrahedra, then the tetrahedra uh, combined together, giving secondary building units. And then we have different types of zeolites with uh, different pores and, and channels of different size as well. And here we have some, some images of the morphology of the materials. So the zeolites can be classified by the number of T atoms at the pore aperture. For example, if you have eight T atoms, silicon or aluminum at the pore aperture, we consider the zeolite uh, a small pore zeolite and then increasing the number of T atoms at the pore aperture, we go from small to extra large or zeolites. And they can also be classified by the dimensionality of the pores. So we have one dimensional zeolites, two dimensional zeolites and three dimensional zeolites. And these properties are, are very important for different kinds of applica applications. So I'm going to talk about different metallic species in this talk, for example, uh, going from a, a metal species present at the structure directing agent, use it for the zeolite synthesis. Also, uh, we can find metallic species uh, in the framework of the zeolite, like the T atom, uh, as charge compensating cations, like uh, I mentioned before, and 
for example, clusters of nanoparticles encapsulated in zeolites or in the pores of the zeolites. So I'm going to talk about some of these examples here in the presentation. So I, as I mentioned, I brought three different scientific cases where I used uh, X-ray absorption spectroscopy to, to study these metallic species. And I will start with the, the first one, where a new family of organic structure directing agents for the zeolite synthesis was, was described. So uh, in this part of the talk, uh, when we synthesize these, these molecules, we call it uh, our Greek gift or our Trojan horse. And you're going to understand uh, throughout the, the presentation why. So in order to obtain uh, new zeolite structures or uh, zeolite structures with new composition, we need uh, to employ different approaches. And the most famous, I, uh, I would say, is the employment of organic structure directing agents like these molecules here. Uh, alternatively, we can use fluoride uh, anions in the, in the synthesis of the zeolite or also germanium uh, as key atoms for directing the uh, D4R units. And these units are, uh, are known to be present in open structures with low framework densities, more, more open zeolite structures. So I'm going to talk about this first example here. Uh, normally, when we synthesize zeolites, we use nitrogen-based organic uh, structure directing agents like the ammonium type of cations. And this ammonium type of cations generated uh, the most famous zeolites that we, we know uh, nowadays. For example, MFI, Beta, Mel, and many others. But in the last 20 years, the, the nitrogen base was uh, somewhat replaced or the uh, phosphorus-based OSDAs were discovered. And apart from, from synthesizing the same zeolites that, was, that were already known for the nitrogen-based, many other uh, new zeolites were synthesized using tetraquilphosphonium cations. So when you calcine the nitrogen base ones, we uh, leave a void space in the zeolite and then we can perform catalysis and separations and ion exchange for examples. And we uh, form CO2, water and NOx. On the other hand, when you use uh, phosphorus based OSDAs, we calcine the, the material we generate CO2, water, and different phosphate-like uh, species in, in the zeolite. And these species can, can serve as probe atoms for, for different type of studies for, for NMR, and can also modulate the acidity of the zeolite because it has a sort of interaction with the, with the structure. So then we thought, Okay, it's possible to synthesize with nitrogen, with phosphorus, but why not with arsenic? So why arsenic? New zeolites uh, could be discovered as in the case of nitrogen and phosphorus. Arsenic is a heavier element than nitrogen and phosphorus. So we can localize the cation inside the zeolite structure. It's also an active nucleus for NMR studies. And also, it opens the possibility to use X-ray absorption spectroscopy to study, like in the in the case of phosphorus, we can study during during calcination and other treatments in situ. So, in this in this in this work, we prepare the the new arsenic-based OSDAs. We synthesize the zeolite with these cations, with these organic cations, and then we study the removal of the OSDA by calcination by uh, in situ X-ray absorption spectroscopy. So for the OSDA preparation, we use uh, 3-ATU arsine 
and we we did an alkylation of this of this molecule with uh, with this compound here, and we obtained the tetrathioarsenium iodide. And for the zeolite synthesis, we normally employ OH uh, anions. So we perform the ion exchange process to obtain this compound here. So these were the synthesis conditions. We employ different uh, ratios of the reactants. And the, you know, the gel compositions were pure silica, uh, silico, uh, German, um, germanosilicate, uh, aluminosilicate, gallosilicate, and borosilicate. And in this, for this work, I will focus on the gallosilicate because we studied also the, the gallium KH by X-ray absorption spectroscopy. So the, the experiments of, of calcination of the OSTA uh, present within the zeolite were, perform, uh, were performed at the arsenic KH to evaluate if we were for, at the end of the, of the calcination, we were going to form arsenic oxides or arsenic zero or any other type of arsenic species. And we also studied, as I mentioned, the gallium KH. Uh, but due to the time here for the presentation, I will focus only on the arsenic KH. So we calcined in oxygen, reduced in hydrogen, and calcined and reduced subsequently using this uh, temperature profile here. And the experiments were performed at the LISA, being line of the SRF synchrotron. So he, uh, these were the conditions I mentioned. And under these conditions in blue, we obtained the MFI zeolite, one of the most important zeolites uh, already known and very important industrially. And here we can see the XRD patterns of the as made zeolites containing the OSDA inside the pores. So all compositions, in all compositions, we have crystalline materials. And one, one thing really interesting is that it was possible to solve the structure of the, of the zeolite by conventional X-ray diffraction using a lab equip equipment. Uh, just because we have the, the arsenic, the arsenic is heavier, so we can, we can easily localize inside the, the zeolite structure uh, without synchrotron radiation, for example. So here we have the scanning electron microscopy images and all materials with all compositions have the typical coffin shape morphology of the zeolite. So it's, it's a sort of rectangular morphology as well. So starting with the X-ray absorption results, here we have the comparison of the, the cation with different arsenic standards. So we can see that the edge position in black uh, of the organic cation stands between the region of arsenic three and arsenic five. And here we have the, the comparison of the arsenic cation by itself and occluded in, inside the zeolites with different composition. And you can see that the spectrum resemble those of the, of the zeolites containing the cation. Uh, so we can say that the, the, the cation is stable up, uh, upon zeolite crystallization in hydrothermal conditions. And this was confirmed by chemical analysis, by elemental analysis and also ICP, that the carbon to arsenic ratio was equal to eight, very close to the theoretical one. Here we have the, the exafs, the first shell, we have the arsenic to carbon contribution. And by fitting this first shell contribution, we have the coordination, the coordination number arsenic to carbon of approximately four, which is in, in good agreement with the, with the theoretical one. And also the distance 1.93 angstroms is in fair agreement with the single crystalline XRD structure for this, for this cation. So uh, at this point, we, we studied the, the calcination of the gallium MFI zeolite. So when we have gallium, 
we have uh, we have a charge to be compensated because gallium is three plus and silicon is four plus. So we have this this charge to be compensated. This is much. This is very important uh, to be mentioned. So we calcine. We increase the temperature up to six hundred degrees and then cool the sample down to room temperature. And we, we can observe here in the zones that we lose this this feature here. And then when we finish the, the calcination process, uh, we have a completely different spectrum of the sample in comparison with the S synthesized one. And uh, this is a no, not normalized data because when we calcine the sample, we are losing uh, some arsenic as, as arsine, as I will, I will comment uh, later. So, by the Zane's analysis, we can say that we don't have uh, uh, metal arsenic, metallic arsenic, uh, nor arsenic 3 or arsenic 5 oxides. As I mentioned, uh, we are losing some arsenic during the calcination process due to the formation of the arsine or other uh, arsenic-based volatiles. And when we reduce the sample, we practically uh, lose all the, the arsenic atoms from the, from the zeolite. And when we calcine and reduce, subsequently, we lose more or less 80% of the arsenic atoms. When you compare the, the ratio between the arsenic and the T atom, present at the zeolite framework before and after the calcination. Before we had uh, this ratio of approximately one. And then after the calcination, this ratio is about 0 0.7, 0 0.8, which is in good agreement with the, with the calcination, between the, the calcination in the lab and the calcination here, the, the, the height of the edge jump that we observed in the, in the Zanes spectrum. So this is in good agreement. We are losing more or less the same in the synchrotron and in the lab. So we compare the, the spectra of the, the sample, the S synthesized sample with the calcined one and also with the standards. And here in the x we have the first shell contribution mainly related to the arsenic to oxide contribution and fitting the sample after after the calcination, we have the coordination number arsenic to oxygen of, of more or less three, and the distance arsenic to oxygen of 1.75. So we wondered what is the local environment of the arsenic since we don't have a uh, similarity between the spectrum uh, in comparison with the, with the standards. So we went to the literature and we found that the, the spectrum was, compare, uh, was compatible with uh, some spectra found in studies regarding adsorption of arsenic by poros solids for water remediation, like forming these inner outer sphere complexes with different coordination numbers. So this is the most likely uh, arsenic local environment after, after the calcination of the OSDA in the zeolite. So, Here's the, com the concept of the Trojan horse, the our Greek gift. We were forming our sign during the calcination. When we reduce, we favor the formation of the R sign. And this experiment was very stressful. And I was really stressed at the time because here we have the attack. And for doing, for performing these experiments, it's very important to have traps and sensors to avoid any, any health problem. So here I, I, I finished the, the first part of my talk and we can open for questions. All right, very good. First, there was a question whether um, you had considered doing phosphorus XAS. Uh, yes, my, my supervisor at the time, they, they work a lot on, on phosphorus-based OSDAs. But they didn't consider because of the because of the the energy for 
for phosphorus uh, X-ray absorption. So we had to work with vacuum, and so it was more complicated to to to, to calcinate and to perform this type of treatments uh, at the at the synchrotron. So they didn't consider. I understand uh, having windows that are both low X-ray absorption and yeah. contain things is trickier. Um, okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, Yang Ha, did you have a question? Yeah, just, hi. <laughs> Interesting talk. So Hello. Um, uh, in terms of arsenic species assignment, I wonder if you have done any other non-synchrotron techniques like, like resonance Raman. Uh, I know Ed Solomon had a serious study on some copper zeolites where they do some resonance Raman and by looking at the uh, copper O vibrational frequencies, they were able to assign the active species in, in the arsenic, mm -hmm. uh, in the zeolites. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, we, we didn't use any other, other technique, for, for example, Raman, uh, infrared, but because this project, this project was like a, a proof of concept. So we stopped at the X-ray absorption and we published the paper. And now the people, the, the people who's working with the, with these cations are working more with the phosphorus base. So no, we didn't consider at the time. Okay. Uh, one other one other question. Um, you're talking about zeolites. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, another uh, nanopore system that, uh, uh, of course, has a, a huge amount of study right now is metal organic frameworks. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering, from a general perspective, can you um, uh, can you tell me something about the difference in application of the two families of materials, or you know, yeah. more similar than different, more different than similar? Yeah, the, I'm also working with metal organic frameworks. My student is here watching the presentation. Uh, <laughs> and she's preparing uh, bimetallic and metal organic frameworks. And for, uh, for EXAFs, the, as, as you probably, probably know, uh, the metal organic frameworks are, are very nice because of the, of the chemical composition. We have carbon, so it's, it's uh, quite transparent. Uh, material. So we have generally, generally we have good XF data of metal organic frameworks. This is from X-ray absorption perspective, but it, the MOFs are better than the zeolites for, for XF. Uh, but about the, the applications and the, the general properties of, of both classes, the zeolites are more uh, thermal and chemically stable. Than the moths, the moths. Some 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 types of moths they have uh, some problems with the with the thermal thermal stability and also chemical stability. For example, in zeolites, you 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 don't have problems with uh, water stability. They, the zeolites are normally water stable. You can use very harsh conditions. For example, high temperature um, water vapor, and the zeolite is just normally stable. Of course, depend, it depends on the composition, but uh, I would say that the main difference is the, the chemical composition and the stability. But the MOFs, on the other hand, are very, very flexible. You can have thousands of different structures which we cannot find in, in, in the case of zeolites. So for MOFs, I think we have much more flexibility for, for, for example, for fine chemical synthesis uh, in catalysis, also for uh, gas separation and gas and adsorption. So this is my feeling about the, the difference between the, the, two, the two classes. Sorry, I was muted. Excellent, thank you, that's very helpful. Um, you should continue, please. Okay. So, so now I'm, I'm going to move to the second top 
of my talk, uh, I will talk about uh, silver loaded zeolite and the application of these of this materials in the selective oxidation of ammonia. So the silver loaded zeolite represents a, a very good model system for studying cluster and nanoparticle formation. So uh, when we have a, a silver loaded zeolite, we can expect that zeolite pore topology here I brought three different uh, zeolite topologies. Uh, and we think that the pore topology could drive the clustering of different metallic species. So uh, by applying temperature in a different atmosphere, atmosphere we can have either uh, silver plus, silver oxide, silver nanoparticles, or silver clusters of different nuclearity. And of course, the nature and the size of these species can impact the catalytic properties. So uh, the SCO of ammonia or selective catalytic oxidation of ammonia is the reaction for converting ammonia, oxidizing ammonia into nitrogen and water. But uh, what about these this ammonia emissions? This, the ammonia emissions represent uh, about 44 million tons per year. And it comes from agri mainly from agriculture, biomass combustion, and also fuse combustion. Uh, and here uh, I have the example of the SCR of NOx, uh, the selective catalytic reduction of NOx using ammonia. Normally we have a, a tank of urea. So without the use of this, of this tank of this catalytic system, we have 2.2 milligrams per, per, per kilometer. And with the catalytic systems that, uh, in which the urea is converted to ammonia and then we have ammonia slip, uh, with this catalytic, catalytic system, we have 85 milligrams per kilometer. So this is a, an issue. And the, the silver uh, based uh, catalysts, they are, they are normally very active for this reaction. But the nature of the active sites not uh, fully understand, especially for silver-based zeolite. So in this work, we studied this, this system. So for this work, we synthesized two zeolites. Uh, as I mentioned before, we can have zeolites with different types of pores. In this case, these two were uh, small pore zeolites with, pore, with pores of more or less three to five angstroms of, uh, at the pore aperture. So we have the zeolite Ho with so uh, sodium and cesium cations and the zeolite Chabazite with potassium cations. And here we have different silicon to aluminum ratios. That is, we have different uh, amount of aluminum in the, in the structure and consequently different, uh, different charge to be compensated for by the cations. So we have these two materials and for chabazite, we have two different silicon to aluminum ratio. And normally the ratio between the, the cation and the aluminum is about one. We incorporate, we incorporate silver by ion exchange process using these conditions here, using silver nitrate. And at the end, we obtained the silver to aluminum ratio of 0.6 or 0.7, and you can uh, ask why not one, why you, you, we obtain 0 0.6, 0 0.7. This is because of the, the size of the pore aperture. Since the, the, the zeolite is a small pore one, there, there is some diffusional problems during the ion exchange. So to obtain about one, you have to do a uh, sequential. Uh, ion exchange processes. So here we have the chemical composition obtained by EDX. We have more or less 0 0.7, 0 0.6 uh, of the silver to aluminum ratio. And this represents 26% uh, of silver in the silver chabazite material with more aluminum, 14% of silver in this chabazite with more aluminum, and 16% of, uh, of silver in the roseolite with the same aluminum as the CHA of silicon to aluminum ratio of four. 
So here's the chemical composition. Starting with the X-ray absorption results, here we have the, the three prepared zeolites in comparison with the uh, tetrafluorborate, silver tetrafluorborate. And we have the, the position of the absorption edge at the same position. So, and also the, the features of the, of the zane spectrum is, is, they are very similar. So we can say that the silver is, is present as silver, silver plus in, in the zeolites. And as I mentioned, the spectra resemble uh, that of the silver tetrafluorate. And we also, we, we didn't notice the presence of silver oxide or silver, silver metal. So the, we can say that the ion exchange process was successfully successful. Here we have the exaps. For the, for the zeolites, we have mainly one, one peak, the first shell, related to the silver uh, to oxygen contribution. And by, by fitting this, this contribution, we obtain the coordination number uh, silver oxygen of around three with two different distances, silver, silver oxygen, 2.26 and 2.42. So we have quite isolated because we don't have uh, higher shells here in the, in the zero lights. So we confirm that we have ions, uh, silver cations spread uh, within the zeolite. For, for this reaction, for the, for the X, uh, SCO of ammonia, in a previous studies, we observed that the silver zero was the active, uh, was the active species for converting ammonia into nitrogen. So you can see here in the purple curve that when we have nanoparticles uh, at the, the surface of the zeolite, we obtain 100% uh, of conversion at more or less three, two, uh, 200 degrees. And when you have silver cations, we don't have uh, a good conversion. We have more or less the same profile as the thermal decomposition of ammonia. So we can say that the silver, uh, silver metal is the active species for, the, for this reaction. So taking this into account, we activated the zeolite using 10% of hydrogen in helium at different temperatures, 100 degrees, 200 and 400. So here we have the X-ray absorption results for the chabazite. And I, I remember you that this, in this sample, we have the silico to aluminum ratio of two and 26% of silver. This is very important for the comparison uh, we are going to do after. So here in the zanes for the chabazite zeolite, we can see that depending on the temperature that we reduce the samples, we have uh, the flattening here of the oscillations after the edge. The, and this flattening indicates that we have different particle size for the nanoparticles formed uh, in the chabazite. And here in the exaps, we observed, we confirmed this by increasing the temperature, we increase the silver, silver, silver contribution. And at 400 degrees, we reach the same uh, magnitude of the bulk. So for chabazite, silicon to aluminum ratio of two, we reach the book. By fitting this, we observe the increasing of the coordination number and increasing also in the distance, the silver-silver distance, which is in good agreement with the, with the, with nano species, with finite size of species. On the other hand, for the roseolite, another structure with silicon to aluminum ratio of four, so we have less, aluminum and consequently less silver. Here we have 16% uh, of silver. We observe quite the same, the flattening of the oscillations here after the edge. But in this case, when you reduce the samples at 400 degrees, we don't reach the bulk. The coordination number that we obtain is more or less uh, 8.6. And also we observe the increasing uh, of the silver silver contribution. So for the roseolite, we don't we don't reach the the bulk, the bulk size of of the species. So we can say, well, 
for the for the chabazite to have much more silver so it's logical to obtain the bulk for the for the zeolite in, in comparison with the ho but when you we treat we reduce the achabazite zeolites the same zeolite but with much less silver uh, the silver loading is compared uh, here we can compare with the ho zeolite we also obtain the book the the same coordination number as for the for the other chabazite structure so it seems that we have uh, an structural effect so let's check it by another perspective by UVVs that is very famous for ascribing uh, this type of species species so when we, when we when we increase the temperature from 100 degrees to 400 we pass from clusters to this wide band to two bands here which is characteristic of bulk size of of silver with this band here at 400 nanometers and for the other chabazite with less silver but same structure we obtain also this profile for bulk these profiles are, are very famous very uh it's reported to be to be bulk on the other hand, when we have the roseolite with other, other, other type of, of cages or other structure, we when we pass from 100 degrees to 500 degrees, we pass from clusters, different types of, of clusters with different nuclearities. It's very, it's it's really hard to, to ascribe uh, the nuclearity of the cluster, but uh, at 200 degrees and 400 degrees, we have this band center here and. 230 nanometers, which is ascribed to silver eight clusters in the literature. So we can see that we have, in fact, different species between the two zeolites. So we wondered at the time uh, if is this an structural effect or, or the cesium? Cesium is the cocation of this zeolite here, and cesium is very big. So cesium could be limiting the particle, the particles growing. So we wonder that. And in, in order to, to validate this, this hypothesis that the structure is playing a role in the, in the formation of the species, we eliminate, we, we exchange all cesium cations from the zeolite. We exchange it by uh, sodium and also by protons we mainly obtain the, the same profile. A little bit different between, between among the samples, but we have mainly the same band uh, in the UV spectrum. So we can say that we have an structural effect. So just to be clear, we have two zeolites with the same, uh, the same zeolite reduced at 400. Uh, in which we have book silver, then the same zeolite reduced at 100 degrees, in which we have silver clusters, so same loading, same zeolite, and you have same loading but different zeolite. Uh, silver chabazite with silicon to aluminum ratio of four reduced at 400 degrees, book silver, and then silver ho reduced at 400, where we have silver clusters. So we have uh, a good comparison. We have same same species silver book and same species silver clusters. So we can really compare in the catalysis, and this is what we have done. Here we have the the curves of, of catalysis of ammonia conversion, if as, as a function of the temperature. So we can see here the chabazite with book and more silver. In this case, we have more. Uh, more conversion at lower temperatures. Then we have the other uh, other uh, zeolite with bulk silver right here, and then we have the zeolites with clusters. So the the zeolite with clusters presenting less catalytic activity, and we wonder why. So we analyze the samples uh, in situ. We perform the, the catalytic reaction uh, by X-ray absorption. And we can see here 
that uh, the, the Chabazite, where we had the silver bull, we still have the silver silver contribution after the catalytic reaction after 600 degrees. This is uh, room temperature, okay? So we have the reestablishment of the silver oxygen contribution, but for the roseolite with clusters, we mainly uh, we lost the silver silver contribution. Uh, almost totally. So we can say that we have a redispersion. The silver is being oxidized during catalytic reaction. And so we lost the, the catalytic sites. And this was confirmed here uh, by UVVs. For the active zeolite, we have the maintenance of the bands. They change a little bit, but we have the man this maintenance. But for the whole zeolite, we have this disappearance of the the silver metal bands. And we have only this band at 220 nanometers, characteristic of silver plus. So the silver uh, clusters are not stable during reaction conditions and they redisperse back to the zeolite. So this is the cause of the, the different catalytic activity. And this is a proof that not always uh, High dispersion is good for the for the catalysis. Now we can, can have more questions before the last part. Very good, thanks. Um, we've got uh, to begin a technical question. Uh, Matthew Marcus. Yeah, I was wondering uh, if first uh, could the uh, could you activate the silver by exposing it to light as opposed instead of heating it up? It might be a greener way to do it. And along the same lines, uh, uh, how do you avoid uh, photo reduction in the X-ray measurement, especially XFs? Yeah, yeah, this is true. And silver, uh, the notorious. Silver, yeah, yeah, the silver, in fact, could be reduced by light. All the ion exchange pr process uh, we performed uh, under dark conditions, I would say. So to avoid any, any problem with silver, but- right. I was thinking of turning that bug into a feature. Yeah, but mm, we didn't observe any, any radiation reduction hmm. in, in these materials because we, we perform many, 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 many measurements uh, several being times and the silver was always silver plus for the as synthesized materials. So I know that silver is very special and is very sensitive, but we didn't we didn't observe any any strange feature. Interesting. Thank you. Okay. Yang Hao, you have a question about the catalysis? Yeah, so based on my understandings, I feel people are usually more interested in the reverse reaction that converts nitrogen gas to ammonia. Mm -hmm. And there have been lots of studies working on that. So can your catalyst catalyze the reverse reaction as well, or it's just the forward one? Uh, I, I really don't know. Uh, but we, we should give it a shot. OK. All right, that, that may open a new pathway for, for a study, if that works. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And to reduction. Thanks. All right, very good. You should continue with the last part of your talk. Okay, thank you. So now I, I'm moving to the last part of the presentation. Uh, I will talk about subnanometric platinum thin clusters within MFI zeolite. So uh, generally in catalysis, the activity and the selectivity are very dependent on the location of the active site. So performing the engineering of the active site is very important for, for, an, uh, for an outstanding catalytic activity. So here I brought the, the channel system of the MFI zeolite the zeolite is known as Zeta SM5 or silica light. It's one of the top five zeolites uh, of industry, the big five zeolites of industry. And here we have uh, three types of channels. This one's in zigzag, 
called uh, sinusoidal channel, the straight channel, and we have the intersections between these, these channels. Uh, normally, when we impregnate a metal in a poro solid or in a, in a zeolite, we obtain a random metal distribution. So we have metal in all channels and, and cavities. Uh, the, the group of Professor Avelino Corma at ITQ, they wondered if it was possible to selectively locate these metallic species in one or another type of, of channel. And this is what they have done. They localized the metallic uh, platinum thin clusters inside the sinusoidal, sinusoidal channel by employing a one pot synthesis using the TPA cation is a tetrapropyl ammonium cation, very, very, uh, very famous for zeolite synthesis, and also potassium cations. Potassium cations uh, are very re relevant in this study. And by, by doing this, they obtained uh, an outstanding catalytic activity in propane dehydrogenation. So they perform an exhaustive uh, microscopy study using high resolution uh, scan, uh, scanning transmission electron microscopy. And here we can see the platinum clusters of 0 0.4, 0 0.6 nanometers. And here in the image, the black holes are representing the straight channel. Here, the straight channel. So we don't have electronic in, uh, density here. And when they tilt, the plane, the 010 plane, the black lines now represent the straight channels. So we cannot see uh, electronic density in these planes. So we can say that we have a radio selective location of the clusters. And we know that the TEM is statistically poor for, for study the, the whole material. So we, we employed uh, X-ray absorption spectroscopy to, to obtain more information about the size, the, the, the nature of these species and also the size of these species. So here in the Zanes, we, we have different materials with potassium and without potassium, a monometallic and bimetallic, and all materials uh, have the spectra similar to, to platinum foil. So we have here just size effects reflected on Zanes different flattening of the oscillations after the edge. So we in fact have, we in fact have uh, different nano, nano species in, this, in these materials. And here in the exhaust, we have the, the platinum platinum contribution and different intensities. But the materials prepared with potassium present the lower, the, the lower uh, platinum platinum coordination number or smaller platinum, Platinum size, platinum cluster size, and for these materials, the, the for this in blue, the coordination number was less than six. So we can say that the size is more or less applying equations converting the the coordination number into into size. We can say that the the size is more or less uh, one nanometer, which would fit inside the MFI channels, and we also analyzed. The, the thin K edge, and we observed that the, the thin atoms was present as thin oxides, very, very dispersed in the, in the zeolite, but not forming an alloy with platinum, which is uh, different from what is reported in literature for, these, for this kind of system. So this is the, the the conclusion of this part. I would like to acknowledge the, uh, Gerald for, for the invitation, also Santiago Figueroa for recommending my name. And I would like to acknowledge all the all people involved in this, in this work, in the, the fund, funding agencies, the people from Synchrotrons who is collaborating with me, Giovanni Agostini, Deborah Meira, and Carlo Marini, people from my lab. And thank you very much for the for for the questions and uh, I'm available for answering your questions now.
Thank you. That was that was terrific. Um, uh, while we wait for more questions to come in, I apologize. On um, your second part of the talk with the uh, the emissions, I didn't quite follow the the motivation when the um, what emission was going up and what's the problem you're trying to solve. I just missed that. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. No, the, the emission is the ammonia. So the ammonia. Okay. We, we were interested on converting ammonia into nitrogen and water. Okay, and the ammonia is there as part of emissions control against nitrous oxide, or yeah, also because ammonia is used as a, as a reductant for for the process called SER, select selective catalytic reduction of okay. nitrogen oxides. Then we use oxide, a, yeah. normally a, a copper zeolite or a copper basic catalyst, and the the ammonia used. For as as a reactant for this for this conversion, so we we obtain also nitrogen. I understand now. Okay, so in your um, uh, uh, in your category of work, um, uh, do you think there would be any benefit to Herfty or uh, or Rex? You mainly showed the extended exafs, which was dealing with structure. But can you learn anything about? chemical pathways or anything interesting about electronic structure per se by using these other methods? Uh, which methods? Could you repeat this? Uh, high energy resolution fluorescence detection. So silver, mm -hmm. your core whole lifetime is eight volts, 10 volts, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, when I started my PhD, I, my supervisor was, was sending a, a PhD student to Serena de Beer for studying silver silver zeolites by XES and other techniques, because silver, when in, in, in my talk, I, I mainly showed the, the reduction. When you put silver under hydrogen, the silver atoms uh, will reduce for sure, because silver is very noble. But when we can treat the, these materials under helium or under other atmosphere, and you can you can form clusters, very very specific clusters or different clusters that you can you cannot track by by XAS. Mm -hmm. So the the use of X-ray emission and other and high resolution, uh, you can have much more information for sure. But at the same time, you need to. To employ other techniques like TFT and and so on, to 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 fully understand the the clusters that you are forming and etc. Okay. All right. Um, uh, there's a technical question that suggests that you might do better uh, doing ricks at the silver L edge, um, and that's uh, that's certainly correct. Are there any other questions? All right, seeing none, I'll thank you again, Christian. That was a terrific talk.